Okay. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to um, today's meeting. I am Councillor Abigail Marshall Kittung, and I chair the Adults Health and Active Lifestyle Scrutiny Board. At this point, I would like to clarify that while this meeting is being webcast live to enable public access, it is not being held as a public meeting in accordance with the Local Government Act of 1972. As such, it is a remote consultative meeting of the Children and Family Scrutiny Board. The consultative status of today's meeting means that some of the usual formalities will not take place at the start of the meeting. And while it also means that the board will not be in a position to take any formal decisions, today's discussion will still very much help inform the work of the scrutiny board and where necessary, any proposed actions that do require formal ratification will be referred to the next formal public meeting of the scrutiny board for approval. I would now like to invite members of the scrutiny board, including those who may be in attendance as a substitute member to introduce themselves in the following alphabetical order. Councillor Anderson. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Councillor Caroline Anderson. I represent Adlan Wharfdale Ward. Thank you, Councillor. Dr. Beale. Good afternoon, John Beale. I'm Chair, Chair of Health Watch Leeds uh, and a co-opted member of this board. Thank you, Councillor Cunningham. Afternoon, everyone. I'm Lou Cunningham, one of the Armley Ward councillors. Thank you, Councillor Dowson. <laughs> Councillor Jane Dowson, Chapel Allerton Ward councillor. Thank you, Councillor Gibson. Good afternoon, everyone. Councillor Gibson, Crossgates and Winmore Ward. Thank you, Councillor Harrington. Afternoon, everybody. Councillor Norma Harrington, Weatherby Ward, and also Chair of Outer North East Community Committee. Thank you. Councillor Hartbrook. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Councillor Comrade Hartbrook, uh, Rothwell Ward. Thank you. Councillor Kidger. Hi, Councillor Wynne Kidger, representing Marley South. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Latty. Good afternoon. Councillor Graham Latty, I represent Geisley and Rawdon Ward. Thank you very much, Councillor Latty. Councillor Nash, she's substituting for Councillor Iqbal. Can you uh, hear me now? I can, loud and clear. Fabulous. On. Um, uh, good afternoon, I'm Elizabeth Nash, um, and I represent Hunslet and Riverside, as does my colleague, Councillor Iqbal, who is away at the moment. Thank you very much for joining us. I would now like to invite the officers supporting um, our meeting today to introduce themselves. Um, Angela. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Angela Brogdon, Principal Scrutiny Advisor. Thank you very much. Harriet. Good afternoon, everyone. Harriet Spate, Governance Officer. Thank you very much, officers. I will now invite board members to declare any disclosable, pecuniary or other interests. Do we have any? Okay, I take that as a no. A note of the, of the scrutiny's cons, um, board's consultative meeting, which was held on the 15th of June, 2021, has been provided for your information. While this is not for formal approval, members will have this opportunity now to raise any matters in relation to the note. Do we have anybody with any comments from the 15th of June? Okay, thank you. We're gonna to move to item three, and that's the health bill. Last month, the board expressed an interest surrounding the anticipated health and care bill of 2021 and 2020, which really is the main agenda that we have got today. And the implications of this for health and social care in West Yorkshire and Leeds, particularly with regards to the development of the new local integrated care system. The board does acknowledge the work of the West Yorkshire Joint Health Overview and Scrutiny Committee in liaising with the West Yorkshire and Harrogate Health and Care Partnership to consider the implications of the legislative proposals for West Yorkshire, including a focus on the potential future role of scrutiny as part of the new ICS system. The joint committee met very recently on 20th July to consider this matter further. 
And so this board will be kept updated on its ongoing work. And I can confirm that Councillor Lati and myself were at that meeting. However, the main purpose of today's meeting is to provide an opportunity for this scrutiny board to discuss the development of the local integrated care system with representatives across the local health and care system, particularly following the recent publication of the health and care bill. With the agenda pack, members have been provided with a link to complete published version of the bill, as well as a copy of a report on the health and care bill published by the House of Commons Library. The Director of Adults and Health has also provided a report, report which summarizes the main points of the health and care bill in context for health and social care in West Yorkshire and Leeds. In addition, the director today will also be providing a presentation to the board this afternoon. I will now invite all the participants um, who are here with us today to kindly introduce themselves. I will start with Councillor Benner. Oh, hi everyone. I'm, I'm Councillor Fiona Venner. I'm the Executive Board Member for Adult and Children's Social Care Early Years and Health Partnerships. And the Health Partnerships part of that is that I chair Health and Wellbeing Board. And in that role, um, I'm the elected member in Leeds who engages with the regional work that's happening at the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Venner. Good to have you as always. Councillor Arif. Thank you, Chair. I'm, hi, everybody. I'm Councillor Salma Arif. Uh, I represent Gipton Hare Hills Ward, and I'm also the Cabinet Member for Public Health and Active Lifestyles. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you for joining us. Kath? Good afternoon, everyone. Kath Roth, Director of Adults and Health for Leeds City Council. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining us, Victoria. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Victoria Eaton, Director of Public Health. Thank you very much for joining us. Do we have Tony Cook today? Yeah, we do. Thanks, Councillor. Uh, Tony Cook, Chief Officer, Health Partnerships. Thank you, Tony, for joining us. Sarah? Hello, everyone. I'm Sarah Munro. I'm the Chief Executive at Leeds and York Partnership Trust. And also within the West Yorkshire Integrated Care System, I lead on mental health and disability and autism. Thank you very much for joining us, Sarah. Fee? Hello, I'm Thea Stein. I'm the Chief Executive of Leeds Community Healthcare Trust. Thank you very much for joining us. Vice? Hi, I'm Visa Peshan Sykes. I'm the Chief Finance Officer at NHS Leeds CCG, and I'm here for Tim Riley, who's the Chief Exec and who's on holiday this week. He's lucky. Thanks for joining us. Stephen. Good afternoon, everybody. My name's Stephen Gregg. I'm the Governance Lead for the West Yorkshire and Harrogate Health and Care Partnership. Thanks for joining us. I believe Julian Hartley will be joining us, but then will be will be joining us about two o'clock. If that's correct, is that right, Angela? That's Excellent. Correct. Okay. Like I did say earlier, we've got Kath here who will be um, having a presentation. But just before Kath comes in, I'd just like to ask Councillor Venner or Councillor Arif, would you like to make any introductions, or would you like me to go straight to Kath? What would you um, I'm, I'm happy to make, to make some comments to start with. Councillor. Um, yeah, so um, I thought I'd make some introductory comments, um, assuming everyone's read the paper. So I wasn't planning to talk about any of the technical detail, but I thought what might be helpful is, because obviously my role is around political leadership. So I thought it might be helpful for me to talk about the role of elected members in this process. And also I thought I'd touch on some of the aspects of this that people are worried about. So in terms of, of concerns that have been raised with me. So as I said in my when I introduced myself, I engage with these structures within my role. So within the councils in West Yorkshire, the leaders of the council and the chairs of the health and wellbeing board are the people that are engaged with the meetings around the this this, this regional way of working. Sometimes that's the same person. So the leader chairs the health and wellbeing board, but in Leeds, it's myself and Councillor Lewis. And we have a partnership board that's referred to in the paper that's chaired by Councillor Tim Swift, who's the leader of Calderdale. And we also have a political meeting that's that's just the um, count the health and wellbeing board chairs and leaders from the authorities. So in a 
in like a really, really brief nutshell, the, the sort of the main change, I suppose, for us in Leeds is that the, the clinical commissioning group will cease to exist and its functions will move to being delivered largely by the integrated care system. And within that, there's two, two aspects of, of government. There's two main governance boards. So there's the NHS led board, which will largely carry out the statutory functions of the CCG. It does have local representation on it as outlined in the Act. We don't know who that will be yet. I would imagine it's most likely to be a chief exec or a leader from one of the authorities. And then, and then there is in the Act that you have a partnership board and that's a structure we already have in West Yorkshire and that has much wider representation in terms of the third sector, local authorities, health watch, etc. So one of the really obvious concerns that people have that's that's been raised with me is, ju is just the fact of regionalisation. And does that mean that resources and services will move from areas like Leeds and be delivered regionally? And I suppose what I wanted to say about that is there's a really genuine commitment from everyone who's involved in that, this process, whether they're politicians or officers or you know, chief execs of trusts across West Yorkshire, there's a real commitment to keeping services in, in, in the places where people live and where they need them and only operating on a regional level where it makes sense to do so. So, for example, at the moment, um, I think the paper refers to some very specific forms of bariatric surgery that we do regionally because that's more efficient and more cost effective. Um, but for all of us who are engaged with this process, and for those of us who are operating at a regional level within this, but very rooted in, you know, in our city or, you know, our authority area, it, it's part of our role to make sure that that commitment to place remains and is, is strong throughout this. And the other concerns that have been raised with me, um, and these obviously do have a, a political edge, is concerns about whether aspects of the Act represent creeping privatisation within the NHS. And there's two aspects of that. One is that within the Act, um, there is the option for private sector providers to be on the partnership boards. Now, there isn't any plan for that to happen in West Yorkshire, um, certainly at the moment, but the legislation does allow for it. And Virgin Care are on partnership boards in some part of the country. I think it's the South, south somewhere. Um, and the other aspect that people are concerned about is, is the repeal of Section 75 of the 2012 Health and Social Care Act. And this is the clause which it, it, it basically removes. Um, so what was so what the clause that was put in in 2012 was that the NHS couldn't automatically award contracts, whether that's to itself or to um, charities or to other providers. There had to be a process of competitive tendering. And NHS campaigners and people on the left campaigned against that vociferously at the time because it, it, it hugely extended the role of competitive tendering within the NHS. So it's really ironic that the same people are now really concerned about, um, about this clause being removed. Um, and there'll be some things about that that are really good. So as, as many of you know, I used to be the Chief Executive of Leeds Survival Aid Crisis Service, which has an NHS contract. You know, it's paid by the NHS to deliver services, crisis services that keep people out of psychiatric beds, out of a &E, etc. Um, and competitive tendering is really threatening to an organisation, you know, like Leeds Survival Aid Crisis Service, because your contract could easily be lost to a cheaper um, you know, private sector organisation, or there's a lot of really big super charities that are very acquisitive and snaffle up contracts that belong to little, you know, that have been delivered by little grassroots community organisations. So you would think actually re re removing the need for competitive tendering could be a good thing. But I think the concern about it shows, and I'm not saying this to make a cheap political point, but shows the absolute lack of trust people have in the government and the way they do procurement, because Obviously, there have been some terrible, terrible procurement decisions over the last 15 months, you know, around, you know, contracts to friends for PP that's defective. And I think the concern about, about repealing this part of the 2012 Act is that it will just make it easier to award contracts without any sort of process. Um, so that's the, those are the kind of things that have been raised with me as, as concerns. But again, 
the role of people like myself who are democratically, you know, elected members in this process is to, you know, work with the NHS, um, you know, to a certain extent hold them to account, but also that that's also part of your role as a scrutiny board. And I know Councillor Marshall Catana said this in her opening comments that um, part of part of what you might want to talk about as a scrutiny board is where you will sit within this, where you will position yourself. I don't know enough about that part of the act to know how much choice you've got about that or how much it's prescribed, what your role will be, but scrutiny will have a really key role in this going forward. So it is really good that you're, you've got this on your agenda today because it's really important that you understand the act, you understand the implications of it and therefore we're in a position to be able to scrutinise it. So um, thank you, Chair, I'll leave, I'll leave my comments there. Thank you very much, Councillor Fenner. And you've echoed a lot of um, the concerns when we had the um, joint JUSC meeting um, last week as well, especially when it comes to procurement and private partners. So it will be very interesting to hear from others today and um, what our guest speakers have got to advise us on that. So are you happy for um, Councillor Arif? Do you want to say anything or do you want me to go straight to Kath and then come back to you? Just, just a, a, some brief uh, notes from my perspective. So the, the, the bill provides an opportunity for Leeds um, health and care system to improve health and, and reduce health inequalities as a system that truly promotes uh, the health and well-being of local communities as well as treating illness. And particularly as we move through the next stage of the impact that COVID has had, the focus obviously is improving health and well-being is, is, is more important than ever, particularly in relation to the underlying public health challenges that we've got. Um, and, and work towards building a, a healthier um, uh, city. I guess the key thing that I've got, or the, and the important thing that I think is, is, is how local authorities, elected members, can have an actual say in what happens, and it's not just the NHS talking around the table. And, and it's important. I think the, the conversation we have today will be really helpful. And as Councillor Venner has has said, um, hopefully as a, as a board, as a scrutiny board, we can discuss how we um, could be involved in the in the process. So that's that's the important thing for me is ensuring that local voices, local partners, local elected members are very much part of those conversations. And it's not just the NHS uh, talking amongst themselves. Hopefully that won't happen. But that's all from me, Chair. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Councillor Arif. Appreciate that. Right. So um, over to you now, Kath. I believe you've okay. got a presentation for us. Yes, I'm going to hopefully know how to uh, share my screen. Just bear with me. That's OK. Uh, Angela, have you given her access? Okay. Okay. Right. And I just need to. Oops. I just clicked on the wrong thing then. Just need to get to this bit. It's okay, we're a very patient group. <laughs> Screw this is, I've only got my O level in sharing uh, screens. Right, um, can you see that? Yes, we can. Right, okay, so um, hopefully this presentation usefully summarises the detail that's in the report and it's um, it's a combination of uh, two presentations that came to the health and well-being board board to board event recently um, and I'm first going to cover explaining what's happening at a West Yorkshire level and then I'll go on to talk about what is happening in Leeds and hopefully there's some structured diagrams that will help scrutiny board understand where it fits in that landscape. So just thinking about West Yorkshire uh, and Harrogate Health Partnership, um, it's been around since about 2016 when we were all required to produce uh, sustainability and transformation plans, which then turned into sustainability and transformation partnerships. And out of that has come a five year strategy, setting out priorities for health and care at a West Yorkshire level. Uh, but it also describes how it envisages the partnership working um, at that neighbourhood place and system level to nurture and support the integration of services where that makes sense. <clears throat> there is very much a long tradition of working, work, working locally, uh, things being locally led 
sorry, I'm having a, <coughs> a bit of a croaky moment today, um, and West Yorkshire and the, how the care partnership envisaged its role is to support those objectives and very much subscribes to the concept of subsidiarity. So we feel to a certain extent that the legislation is now actually catching up with the reality of what, what's happening on the ground in West Yorkshire, but perhaps provides further impetus to that goal of integrated care. So just to remind you what is in the West Yorkshire plan, so it's these 10 big ambitions, uh, and you'll notice it goes beyond just sort of pure, um, what we say, traditional health and care. It is looking around the diversity of leadership. It's responding to climate emergency, as well as having a role in strengthening local economic growth. <clears throat> so it's operating model. Um, this picture shows you that there is a, a core team in the ICS, which is in the middle of the flower or the propeller, depending which way your brain works, this particular image with the five um, different local authority areas having their own integrated care partnership. And the green circle, I don't know if you can see my arrow working, is represents the integrated care system as a whole. So the principles of this is around subsidiarity, the notion of distributed leadership, but mutual accountability rather than hierarchy. And we talk about being a partnership of places where collaboration is key, and that can be around provider and sector collaboratives, uh, as well as collaboratives um, within our own local authority areas. And, and, the, and it's very networked. We talk about being a team of teams. So sometimes that's quite difficult to conceptualise, because, but I think it fairly represents the complexity of what it is to work in, in an integrated way. So with the dissolution of the CCG, which will happen <clears throat> on the 1st of April next year, as far as we understand the timeline, those staff will be employed by the ICS and then deployed back into um, our local authority footprints under an integrated care partnership arrangement. And we, we may have to think about what we name things because some of the titles are very similar and could get confusing. But looking at what the white paper says for ICS is, as Councillor Venna has mentioned, first of all, there will be a partnership that partnership will have a responsibility for developing a plan, which is about the wider system. And uh, it is written into the bill that local authorities will have a seat at that table. Um, when you look at uh, local areas, <clears throat> uh, there is more discretion. So what the bill does is mandate a minimum um, makeup of who should be on those boards, but there is discretion to add other partners and parties to it. There will then be an NHS body, which they are calling an integrated care board, um, that will be sort of responsible for what we would recognise as the sort of mainstream NHS responsibility. So strategic planning, it will take on those commissioning functions from the CCG, it will have accountability uh, up to NHS region and nationally for its spend and performance. And the chief executive is the accountable officer for that NHS money allocated to the NHS body. So second bullet point sets out the minimum of who might be on the board. Um, and again, local authorities uh, can expect to seat at that board. Uh, and again, it's responsible for as well as the, the population plan, but also things like a capital plan for the NHS providers within that geography. So obviously place level and in, in the language in which we talk about, so place equals local authority footprint. So place level arrangements uh, between local authorities, NHS and other partners, we have um, discretion as to how we want to organise that and what it's, um, legal status might be and in the body of the written report it, it, it summarises uh, I think it's five different ways that you might be able to do that but the role of the statutory ICS is to support and nurture develop um, 
how we integrate locally and to drive up improved outcomes. Obviously, health and wellbeing boards still stay part of our architecture locally and will still have responsibility about bringing partners together, still has responsibility for uh, the requirement to produce a joint strategic needs assessment and a joint health and wellbeing strategy. So that doesn't go. And the tone of the document, which we like to think actually um, West Yorkshire colleagues had quite an influencing role on in the tone of it, is it, very collaborative. And um, that is seen as the major driver for improvement, not competition. So as Councillor Venner says, I think competitive tendering in the past has been seen as a, a key tool. Uh, and, it, and I think it only takes you so far. And the interest now is, well, what can we do th through collaboration, including a duty to collaborate um, as system partners? Um, so there's lots of opportunities there, but uh, it, it's something that needs work. Um, collaboration doesn't necessarily result in improved outcomes just because you get on with your partners. And I think that's one of the challenges for us locally is to make sure our very productive partnership results in um, improved outcomes. <clears throat> so now we can think about leads. We've got a really clear ambition, which is the green writing. That's the ambition from our health and wellbeing strategy. And I guess we'd say, actually, we think we've been operating as an integrated care partnership for several years. We, we've got a nationally recognized, highly effective health and wellbeing board uh, with a strategy which is a, a reference point uh, across partners for what we do and a very inclusive membership. Sitting underneath that is an officer group of a partnership exec and we've got all sorts of different programme boards, uh, things you'll uh, recognise like our mental health partnership board, um, which all have a role in pulling partners together setting our strategies and delivering on those, including uh, priority setting. So we would say we spent a long time developing shared values and principles by which we operate. We say we are team leads, and I think the past year and a half has really demonstrated that it genuinely is team leads. We've pulled together in a most challenging time I would sort of quote the vaccination programme, a really brilliant example of team leads. So it's not just a concept, it's things by working together uh, where we have delivered on the ground. And we see all those different component parts of our, our, our um, health and wellbeing strategy, our values, our principles, um, our commitment to having better conversations, all of that adds up to a tattoo totality of our, our integrated care partnership. So we think that's a strong foundation stone upon which to build um, on the requirements that are set out in the legislation. <clears throat> so here's a diagram, which is the as is. So this at the moment before the legislation kicks in. So across the top in yellow, um, it sets the landscape of the different boards and partnerships we have. So starting in the top right hand column, we've got local care partnerships, which we see as our, pretty much our foundation stone and building block for integrated care in Leeds. We've got a focus on health inequalities, which has really played a very strong role as we've um, tackled some of the inequalities that's come about as a result of the pandemic. We've got enabler boards, which it's a state, it's your IT, it's your workforce, and they support and underpin the work that's happening in the population and care boards. So, for example, if I just unpack some of the acronyms, we've got children, healthy populations, long term conditions, learning disabilities, end of life, mental health, planned um, planned care, cancer, urgent care and system flow. There's all multi-agency, multidisciplinary boards working on those issues. And they all feed into what we have set our stall out to say, if we are successful, this is how the world will shift. And we call this the left shift blueprint. And the detail of that is in the written report in your pack. But those are the metrics by which we 
mark our own homework as to say, are we making the impacts we would like? That uh, feeds into the partnership executive group that then feeds up into the health and wellbeing board. Uh, and off to your right, then you've got the NHS landscape at the moment of the CCG and our providers. So moving on to the new landscape, much of that architecture stays in place. But we now have, and I hope you can see my arrow, this lead integrated care partnership, which we believe we should set up as a joint committee in um, legislative terms. And this would allow the um, devolution of the leads bit of the NHS pot to come in a devolved way to be held by that joint committee. But by being a joint committee, it also allows us to add other pots of money should we wish to, um, to come under the governance of that partnership. So for example, um, we've got the Better Care Fund, we've got pots of money where, where we pull together to pay for the Health and Care Academy and our own health partnership team. Uh, we still have our Health and Wellbeing Board, but then you, you do see here um, a feed up into the West Yorkshire Committee. Uh, and over here on the right, we still have our, our provider landscape as we recognise it. So if we look at the wider partnership, you've got this on the left hand side, you've got what the West Yorkshire landscape looks like. And you can see in yellow, we have the West Yorkshire Joint Overview and Scrutiny Committee. And on the right hand side, which is the Leeds footprint, we've got scrutiny board. But otherwise, <clears throat> these boards very much mirror each other. So you have a partnership board at West Yorkshire level. We have our partnership board is the health and wellbeing board um, at Leeds level. Then you've got the NHS board that has the statutory accountability for the budget and then Leeds working title ICP board, um, which we seek to take a devolved budget from West Yorkshire. Um, so I hope you feel there's some sort of, um, yeah, some symmetry there. So thinking about the Leeds Integrated Care Partnership, so we will have accountability around delivering health improvement and wellbeing for people at Leeds. Our ambition is to have high quality services within that delegated budget and to ensure that's delivered on behalf of and in line with uh, the ambitions of the West Yorkshire ICS and our Health and Wellbeing Board. And the the integrated care partnerships, it's got to provide some infrastructure. We've got to put some mechanisms in place to allow risk sharing, how we use resources, how we provide assurance back to Leeds, but also up to West Yorkshire and above. Um, there is a, an integration responsibility. So it's continuing that development that we've already got around how we deliver integrate, integrated care. We believe it, it, that it's got to be data informed, it's got to be personalised and have a, a strong element of prevention around citizens' needs. And we see the ICP would have responsibility for delivering our ambitions around population health, those metrics in the left shift blueprint and tackling health inequalities. So in order for that to work, uh, and being a subcommittee, it, it's going to have these functions that are set out in the, the bullet points. And they're everything you would really expect from a sort of governing body, really. So around finance, contracts, digital, quality of performance, uh, that strategic planning looking forward. And uh, it will have some leads roles and some joint appointments across into the ICS. So our next steps, as we say, so we're still talking about um, who should be on the Leeds board, what quite its configuration would look like, how we need to engage with all our partners around that. Our ambition is to have a, a shadow board in place by October to sort of give it a go with a sort of coming into statute in April. Um, so working that through, uh, and I, yeah, I think it may need some tweaks or we might get it right first time. 
and to an, a, a, agree an investment plan um, in line with our allocation and what we set out as um, the sort of outcomes we want to see. Um, to support some of that, we're going to have to think again about where does the partnership exec group fit in? Um, are all our current boards fit for purpose? Uh, what should we call it? Um, because they're calling it an ICP at West Yorkshire level. So do we need to call it something different at a lease level just to make that distinction? And we're doing a piece of work at the moment led by the um, Health and Care Academy, which we're calling Hearts and Minds. Partly um, that's to capture all the positive learning from the past 18 months of working together over COVID. So where there was really fantastic examples of integrated working, let's capture it. Let's look at the learning. What made that work? Why was it so successful? What happened to make it be set up so quickly? Um, so we can almost not Have we lost Kath? Seems that way, Chair. I can't yeah. hear. You can hear her. I can't hear her, Chair. Okay. I think we have Chair. Yes, right. Okay. Can we, um, Angela, are you able to take us back to the um, full screen, please? Without the presentation. Okay, can we, yeah, can we try to see if we can get Kath back because obviously we're going to go into um, comments and questions now and obviously we um, Kath Chair, back. Chair, yeah. Kath's just texted me to say she's just had a power cut. So right. I don't know how quickly or easily she'll be able to get back. But, okay. but to Tony's here in terms of being able to answer questions and also Theo and other people are involved in in the work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah um, thanks, thank, th thanks, Chair. And Kath was just going to close with a point that um, what we've ultimately got um, on this is is very much an evolutionary um, response um, and the culmination of, of a huge amount of work from a, from a huge amount of people uh, in Leeds, and that, that we're in a strong position as a city to to move forward with a particularly Leeds focused approach. Okay, thank you very much, Tony. Um, we'll do a few introductions again just before um, we can see if Kath is able to join us. If not, we will continue with. I know we've got a very good, solid team here today that will be able to answer um, questions. I believe Julian has joined us. Would you like to introduce yes, him? Yes, that's correct. Hello. Hi, everyone. Apologies for joining a little late, but glad to be here. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, and you're welcome. I have also seen another colleague here, Councillor David. I'm sure I saw him somewhere on the screen. Is he still here? Okay. Now, earlier on when I was introducing my board, can you believe I forgot Councillor Taylor? So please, Councillor Taylor, forgive me. Can you kindly introduce yourself? I'm really sorry. Yes, I'm Councillor Taylor and I represent Chapel Allerton Ward. I do forgive you, Councillor Marshall. Thank you very much. Right, board, over to you now. We had, we got the majority of um, Kat's presentation. So we're now open for discussions, debates, questions, comments. Over to you. What? No hands up? That's better. Dr. Bill. You need to unmute yourself. I am hopefully unmuted and hopefully coming up on the screen now. Yeah. Um, first of all, in her absence, I'd like to thank Kath for taking us through that introduction. That's been a very comprehensive look at the situation. And uh, I have to say that uh, for the most part, I agree with her. We've been doing most of this for a number of years uh, and it's just being built on um, 
in, in the legislation. However, I do want to raise a, a number of issues because at the end of the day, what we have to ask is, what difference is it going to make to our community? What difference is it going to make to addressing the inequalities which leads us uh, had as a main principle for a number of years? Um, so just four points I'd like to make, if I may, Chair. The first is of timing. Um, in my, um, I have to say, fairly long uh, career in the NHS, I've been through what I'm told is something between 15 and 20 reorganizations of the NHS. Um, and each time, and, and, and I have to say that that's both under conservative and Labour governments, so it's, I'm not making a political point about uh, a specific party reorganizing the NHS. Each one has promised that things would get better, but each one has also been costly. It's been costly both in terms of the financial costs of the reorganization, uh, but also in terms of the effect on the staff, uh, staff having to reapply for what are essentially their own jobs and the disruption to the working relationships which have been built and need to be rebuilt in the new structure. And we're, Chair, we're just coming out of a pandemic. Uh, we look around and we see that there are major problems in the NHS, increasing waiting lists, people not being able to get treatment, people not being able to get a diagnosis, workforce shortages, GPs were short of, hospital doctors and nurses were short of, dental workforce were short of. Um, is it not uh, that we ought to be putting all our efforts at this current time into addressing those problems in the NHS and social care has its problems as well, underpaid staff working, vacancies and so on. So is it the right time to be doing this? Can we not just, or should we not just be carrying on doing what in Leeds we're doing so well um, without going through this major reorganization? Secondly, the issue of integration, as Kath has said, We've been doing integration. We've doing, been doing collaboration between the NHS and social services for a number of years now. Leeds has a good track record, but if you look at the bill, it's not the health and uh, care bill. It's the NHS bill. Where is social care uh, in this bill? Uh, very little. It seems that social care is, well, I was going to say taking a back seat. It's not even in the back seat chair, it's in the boot. It's hardly there. Uh, and we really need, we've been promised uh, a reorganization of the co social care system. We're still waiting for it. Uh, the prime minister has talked about um, uh, cross party uh, discussions. Uh, as I understand it, they haven't taken place we really need to look at the role of social care working with the NHS. Thirdly, uh, I'd like to address the issue of the patient voice. Uh, it makes lip service to uh, focusing on the health and care services, um, listening to the patient voice. Now, one way of doing that is through Health Watch. And if, if I might be forgiven, Chair, I'd like to make a point which is specifically about uh, the role of Health Watch, because it's very clear that Health Watch and other sources of the patient voice need to be very much part of the new structures. And that's at both place level where Leeds uh, and Health Watch Leeds uh, has played a, an important role, we believe. Uh, in the patient voice in Leeds, that needs to continue, but also it needs to be heard at the, uh, what I would call the regional in inverted commas, the West Yorkshire and Harrogate level as well. Now in Leeds, we have a, a five year contract with the city council, we're very grateful for that. Uh, the funding comes from the city council um, or via the city council, um, and we have the, the budget set for a five year period, uh, but uh, that doesn't go up. That, that is going to be the same in real 
in, in actual cash terms for five years. In other words, we are already suffering a, uh, a cut each year in real terms, in the money which Health Watch is receiving. So we need to make sure that Health Watch within Leeds is ad adequately covered, but we also need to make sure that some form of Health Watch is covered at a West Yorkshire and Harrogate level. And that could be in one of two ways. It could either be a new, call it a West Yorkshire and Harrogate Health Watch, um, but the, the uh, preferred option of the local Health Watch across West Yorkshire is that each of the Health Watch uh, within the, the components of West Yorkshire and Harrogate um, are funded to have a collaborative role uh, relating to the West Yorkshire and Harrogate level. Uh, and we believe that it's very important that that funding is made available. Um, and lastly, if I may, oh, the other thing I wanted to say about the integration is where local authorities are represented, represented on the board, but where's social care? There's no direct, there is, there is obviously a chief executive, there's a, uh, a finance officer, there's a medical director, there's a chief nurse, not a mention of a director of social services, not a mention, I have to say, of public health either, and that should be a crucial part of any uh, strategy within the health and social care system. And, and the, my fourth, if I may, Chair, is, is very quickly to mention a rather detailed uh, point. Currently, before discharge, a patient should have an assessment to see what social care uh, needs uh, that patient ne is going to be required. The proposal in the bill is that, that is put off until after the patient has been discharged and wherever they're then living, been there for a while. But Chair, that means that there's a possibility that they, if no assessment is carried out before they uh, are discharged, then they may not have the right support at the point of discharge as they go into their own home or to a care home or whatever it might be. Chair, it needs to be assessed before they go, so that they go uh, out into the community with the right support. And of course, continually assessed the whole of the time which they need uh, social and other care. So uh, my concern is that patients may lose out if the legislation about pre-discharge uh, assessment is, is altered. Uh, thank you. So, sorry for having gone on so long, Chair. That's okay, Dr. Bill. Thank you very much. So we've got four very pertinent questions from Dr. Bill, who is happy to respond to that amongst the team. <coughs> Councillor Venner, do you know who's best place to come in? Is that you, Victoria? Yes, Victoria's got her hand up to at least Probably answer, left. I guess, the public health base. So thank you, Chair. I can certainly comment from a, a Director of Public Health perspective and um, that there are um, other, other, others of uh, uh, John's questions which um, other colleagues may want to pick up on um, specifically. Um, just, to, just to start by, by um, saying that um, when, when Kath um, presented the 10 key ambitions of the West Yorkshire ICS strategy, you'd have seen in there that they are incredibly bold ambitions about um, reducing health inequality, increasing healthy life expectancy, reducing suicide rates, etc. Um, it's incredibly positive that we've got such bold ambitions for both Leeds and West Yorkshire in our integrated care system, but there's absolutely no way we know we can achieve those just by having a narrow response from the the um, the, the NHS on its own. So that 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 that. that that ask um, John around, you know, you know, where is the wider system, and and the wider system is so important if we're going to um, go anywhere near achieving those ambitions is certainly supported by ourselves as di directors of 
public health. Um, one of the things that there's a there's a kind of a series of key asks that are coming from directors of public health and um, to the new system nationally, um, and one of those is reflected in Councillor Arif's comments earlier around uh, we have to have improving health at the heart of the new bill um, rather than just a you know a reorganization of, of the, the, the the care system um, the health and care system and um, I think that's something that you know we're certainly committed to locally um, and you know we, 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 we need to keep that high on the agenda in terms of looking at how prevention, improving health and well-being and reducing health inequality is embedded in every single work stream um, across West Yorkshire and, and for Leeds. So I, I, I really support those comments uh, John and it reflects the, uh, the Director of Public Health kind of um, response. Um, the, um, the, an, another comment was around um, strong relationships with um, elected members and local authorities and th there is something really important um, and Councillor Venner touched on it earlier in a comments around the really close collaboration between the um, the ambitions and programmes of this new system, either at a West Yorkshire or Leeds level, and our health and wellbeing strategy locally. And I think that that, as Kath set that out, that, that seemed to be important, but we need to locally ensure that those really strong mechanisms are there and it doesn't kind of fall fall off the edges, as it were, of the, the, the core focus of the, the integrated care partnership. The, um, the point around um, engaging patients and communities, uh, I think, is really critical. Um, integrated care system has always done very well is have this principle of subsidiarity. So obviously, things should be done as local as possible, and it's local by default. Um, so um, we, we need to ensure we kind of maintain that principle and way of working, but but very, very mindful of making sure that we work with all of the assets in our communities and use those assets, including patient voice and, um, you know, third sector organisations, real trusted um, community assets in, in how we do business in this new world. And I think that locally, um, we you know we're really committed to, to making sure that happens and it won't happen on its own. I think that the last thing I just wanted to add from a, a public health perspective is that um, the, um, the the scope of the um, the work of the ICS, the responsibilities of the ICS, um, is continuing to develop. So last Thursday we had a, a letter uh, nationally from um, Amanda Pritchard from NHSE, uh, Deputy Chief Exec, um, and uh, she outlined new responsibilities that the ICS will take on from uh, next year and they include a whole load of public health programs which include um, vaccination, screening, immunisation um, and others um, which so far have been taken up in the responsibility nationally of NHS England. So we are starting to see more and more public health responsibilities come down to this to the local level which is a real opportunity for us but we've got to absolutely um, see that as the core business of, 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 of both the Leeds level and the West Yorkshire, the work we do. So I really support your, your comments, John, and it really echoes what we're trying to do uh, locally. Thanks, Chair. Thank you very much, Victoria. Um, are, you, are you still commenting on um, Dr. Bill? Is that right? Or you've got Thank questions? You. I've seen your hands up. Is that, that me? Sorry, I tap for a second there. But yeah, just to answer um, John's point, uh, particularly around, around Health Watch and the importance of Health Watch and patient voice. I mean, Health Watch has been an absolutely key part of the of, of the system, unquestionably, over the last few years in Leeds. You know, everything from the the, the work around mental health, which was really groundbreaking, um, all the way through to to the insight on on vaccine and vaccine inequalities and the survey that's been done regularly uh, over the last few months. And, and obviously, John, you know the work that you've been doing as well around dentistry, really. And I think one of the key points that that you've brought through a number of these um, reports by Health Watch, which is why integration is so important. It's just the importance of, of seamless services 
people in the community, they, they don't expect us to be overly bureaucratized and to have highly complex referral routes and pathways and systems. They expect us to work together, really. So to my mind, you know, there are there are issues unquestionably that you've touched on around the problems of, you know, new things that are being introduced in the NHS and new pieces of legislation. But our approach in Leeds is, is to take the Leeds approach, which is rooted in a, a very integrated um, patient first, community focused model uh, and to build on that. And I think that's one of the things that, that we're absolutely trying to, to do here as well. And then, then finally, because I know Kath's on now, but I don't think she, she had the, the social care question that, that you asked, but the issue around funding and workforce there is, is absolutely central. There's no question, you know, we saw quite a lot of people coming into social care uh, in the early part of the pandemic, but there are now challenges, as we know, due to the wage structure and competition with supermarkets and, uh, and other employers as they, you know, get back on track, really. So the point is a, is a valid one and one that's hugely important to us and one that we've made to, to central government, as you probably know, on a number of occasions around budgets and, and, and workforce and, and getting a fairer offer to, to people that work in the system. Thank you very much, Tony. Um, welcome back, Kath. We missed you for a few minutes. Um, in our earlier pre-meet, we were talking about the pros and cons of uh, remote meetings. So power outage is one of the cons that we have. So welcome back. And Tony did finish up for you. So that's really good. And we're just into comments now. So Councillor Gibson, over to you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll lower my hand. Um, so, I mean, just as you get your head around one NHS reorganisation, then another another one happens, as Dr. Beale has um, has already mentioned. So, I'm, I'm, and I am not completely au fait with um, with this with the new um, uh, the new reorganisation. But I just so I wanted to ask a question around funding funding agreement. So, is it the case that the West Yorkshire ICP or or is it are we calling it an ICP or we calling it an ICS? Um, to, I'm, I'm sure Kathy said at the end there that it was, we're going to call it an ICP for West Yorkshire. Um, is it the case that the, the, the Department of Health and Social Care agree a, a funding agreement with, um, with the, I'll call it the West Yorkshire ICP for argument's sake, and then it's down to the ICP to, to, the, um, to allocate funding to the individual uh, ICPs based on the local authority footprints, so in this case Lead, Leeds Authority. And, and it's a question for Fiona, actually. Um, what's the what's the political implications of that? You know, I'm just thinking of um, you know different council, local authorities sort of vying for a pot of money within within West Yorkshire. Is is there going to be pro is there problems that you can foresee with that? Um, and the other question I had as well. Um, uh, what we're not entirely sure what options there are. Uh, and opportunities there are for, for ourselves as a scrutiny board to, to be involved. It, when, when, will we, when will we know more about that? And, and, you know, my position would be that we should be in, as involved as we possibly can as a scrutiny board. But what, when will we have uh, a little bit more guidance on, on, on exactly what opportunities there are for us to be involved in this new structure? Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Gibson. Who will go first? Kath or Fiona? I could probably answer my question quite quickly. Um, yeah, obviously that's um, that's when I talked about the things people are worried about. Obviously, when you're looking at operating more regionally, um, that's that's one of the first things people worry about. Is does it mean resources will be lost from their area to a more regional area? And obviously, that's um, as I said, there's a huge commitment to things being delivered in place and that not happening. But it's also the responsibility of people that are involved in this process to make sure that that continues to be the case and that our area specifically doesn't lose out. Because actually Leeds is, I believe, the biggest area um, in, in the country that is not an integrated care system in its own right. So we could have just been our own integrated care system, but actually see benefits to working in this collaborative regional way, which we have been doing for many years before it became you know, a, a requirement in the way that it is now. Um, but obviously, and in some ways that means West Yorkshire needs us more than we need them because we are, you know, the most, the biggest, most well-resourced area. Um, but so obviously all of us who are working at this regional level, but rooted in Leeds will ensure that it doesn't mean that we or any other area um, 
you know, lose out as a result of this way of working, which has been very positive and collaborative so far. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Venner. Um, Kath? On the question of when you might get more guidance, um, I don't know is the short answer. Um, if it's not in the main legislation, then we can expect bits and bobs to come out, but I, I, don't, I have no idea of a timeline. I, Tony, do you have got any more idea than me? It, it just comes out when they get around to writing it. It's been quite, it's been quite piecemeal, um, to be honest. Um, but, um, you know, as we get it, we, we deal with it and we leadsify it, don't we, basically? Um, Tony, even though um, the paper says um, legislation by 20, April 2022, so obviously will things come back, you know, would this come back to ourselves before then? Or um, Chair, Stephen's got his hand up. He, he's probably uh, aware from a government's perspective right. of maybe okay. some of the timelines. Excellent. Thank you. Over to you, Stephen. Yeah, th thank you, Chair. Yeah, we, we're anticipating there is a whole lo load of guidance that is anticipated, some of which is anticipated by the end of uh, end of July. That there's stuff around governance, there's stuff around place arrangements, there's a model constitution. Um, I think, frankly, a lot of it probably won't give us the clarity um, that sometimes we're looking for um, in that the whole uh, the, the legislation is designed to be permissive and to let local areas develop the arrangements that suit you best. And given that given that the bill is largely based around the way that we have successfully worked in West Yorkshire and Harrogate, that really gives us, in many ways, the freedom to, to, pick the, to, to develop the arrangements that work best for us. So uh, I think, as was said in the presentation, we see it very much as, a, as an evolution rather than a, a revolution. We're not like some systems across the country having to set up a lot of stuff from scratch. We're not having to do that. We've got a partnership board in place. We've got effective relationships with health and wellbeing boards. We've got really good relationships at West Yorkshire and Harrogate level with scrutiny and at, and at local level with scrutiny. And there's no real need to change that because it works for us at the moment. So there is a load of guidance coming out. Um, some of it might be helpful, but um, frankly, some of it I don't think will be as specific as uh, some people might like. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Councillor Gibson, is that an old hand or...? Yeah, just quickly to, uh, to follow up then and ask, just wondering if we've, we've been working in a cross-party way, because it sounds like at the, at the moment it, there's an agreement that um, none of the, the local authority or ICPs um, with the local authority footprint are, are going to lose out. Uh, but that, you know, th there's nothing to say that if there's a change of polit political leadership or anything that that, that that wouldn't change and, and they would have different priorities. Of course, that's always the case, but have we been working in a, in a cross-party way to ensure that actually, you know, the, the funding agreements that are in place at the moment roughly would, would remain the same? Okay, anyone wants to comment on that? Right, I'll take another question then. Councillor Latte. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, it, it's the, the, the plans that interest me, the, um, the, the place level plans. And okay, this is West Yorkshire and Harrogate, and it strikes me that the plans themselves, when written, would need to be, to a certain extent, sort of mutually supported. Um, uh, have we got any thinking on those lines? Um, because Different things happen in different parts of this of this area, this region, um, that are useful to others. Leeds has more than most, admittedly. Um, but if you see the drift of my question, are, are we are we going to? Is is there any oversight of the writing of these plans to make sure that they are not mutually exclusive, as opposed to supportive? Uh, bearing in mind, you know the the. There are rather big differences between Leeds and some of its, of its colleagues within um, West Yorkshire and Harrogate. Thank you, Councillor Latty. Any res who's responding? Who would like to respond to um, Councillor Latty? So uh, I'll have a go at responding. I'm, I would expect and anticipate that 
when we write our place-based plan, we will need to submit it to the ICS. In the same way, when we write um, Leeds plans, we always look at and make reference to the health and wellbeing strategy. I would envisage that when we write local plans that we will look at what the West Yorkshire strategy says and make reference to it where that makes sense. I mean, some of the targets, we would definitely need some aligned action around. It would make sense to do so. So um, Sarah might want to comment on how mental health services work together at West Yorkshire and how that might work in reality to deliver against some of those mental health ambitions. But there is still, I would say, plenty of discretion to write plans that nonetheless pick on uh, and focus on things that are particular to Leeds. Okay, thank you very much. Councillor Letty, do you still have a follow-up question? Your hands are still up. I will attempt to pull it down. Thank you. Councillor Cunningham. Thank you, Chair, and thanks, Kath, for that really comprehensive report. Um, I've been in many meetings about the integrated care systems, and I think yours um, wins the medal for the clearest one so far, so thank you for that. Um, I'd like to also um, echo Dr Beale's point, really, about the... Um, about the real need for us to challenge the pre-discharge assessment plans and just you know emphasize how crucial that is but coming on to my um, my other point it's just digging down a bit into the report um, and looking at some of our um, health outcome ambitions um, I just wonder if we could perhaps rethink some of the wording um, I note that we've got um, reduced weight for 10 to 11 year olds. I'm just thinking with um, issues around, you know, body image issues and self-esteem, whether we should be um, talking more about promoting healthy weight or improving health, well-being and fitness, rather than focusing on um, reducing weight. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cunningham. Kath, do you want to respond to that, please? I think that's more one for Victoria as it's a public health target. Yeah, I can pick up on that, Chair. Thanks, Councillor Cunningham. Yes, I I, 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 I agree with your comments. And, and I think that in a way, it, the example you've given illustrates how we need to make sure that we're joining up the system from every part of how we want to look at improving public health and improving outcomes. So the um, in the content of the paper, the targets that are in there are from the, um, the um, plan for um, how the healthcare system is going to work around inequalities. So what was called, as Kath referred to, the left shift blueprint for the, the health system, um, which you know, is a very legitimate set of, of um, priorities and, 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 um, and program areas that, that, that they've committed to. Um, what we need to make sure we do as a city and as a system is link that up to what we as a council with our public health function um, are wanting to um, do around promoting positive health in children and young people so the reason I think it's sometimes there's some different kind of terminology used depending on which bit of the system you're in um, but I think it really illustrates the point that actually um, you know if we join that up as a as a city and a, and a health and well-being board and and what's actually is in the health health um, and well-being strategy is much broader around promoting positive health for that group it, it kind of all fits together so yeah I, I, I think it's a point well made and it's a good illustration of how we need to um you know make sure that that all of this kind of works for all of us not just just one part of the system but yeah thank you for the comment and we'll certainly take that back Thank you. Um, just, a, just a few points to make. Firstly, the, the names of boards and, and language we used. I'm confused already. ICP, ISP, PSC. 
can we just name boards what they are and try and get away from acronyms so have a shorter name but just tell us what it is because you know we're hoping to engage lay people as well as professionals and and you know we, we just can't be talking like this if we're actually trying to engage everybody in leads um, the, the second point was very much what uh, what John was saying, uh, Dr. Beale, about, uh, you know, what are we doing? How much of it are we doing? And is it making any difference at all? So it's uh, it's looking at what success would look like and setting the right priorities, because sometimes things don't go in a straight line. You know, uh, taking loose point, if you are actually overweight, then all the health issues that go with that. So is losing, is, is weight one of our priorities because it will actually help the cancer outcomes and all other things. I'd really like to know what that, that route map looks like to get from where we are to where we want to be on certain, certain issues. Um, so we've talked about deprivation and funding. Uh, in, in a lot of the systems, you get an, an amount of money per head of population, but you also get a weighting on that as well. For, for deprivation and we've mentioned that the health outcomes for people who, who are deprived and live in deprived areas is much worse so are we is, is that going to play any part in the funding calculations at all um i think it was dr beale again that mentioned uh the the, the, the shortage of staff in in a lot of areas uh which makes prevention of things more important if we haven't got the staff to actually deal with things once people are ill um, and finally, uh, it's just a point on, on GPs. We've mentioned the health service. Uh, GPs are the front door. Um, I'm just wondering what input they are having and how prevalent they're going to be in a lot of the plans that are being made. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Delson. And I totally agree, especially when it comes to medical jargon. I'll, I'll, I'll use the word jargon because if you, you don't understand what that means, that will be jargon to you. And there are two professions that use a lot of that, the medical industry and the legal industry. So we have to remember, especially if we're public speaking, that we keep um, the grammar as simple as possible so that everyone understands um, what it means. So please, let's all take note of that. Um, who will be responding to Councillor Delson, please? Yes, I see. Hi, um, thank you. Uh, sorry, I, I was going to respond to Councillor Gibson as well, So, you, uh, but I couldn't find my raise hand function because I don't use Zoom right. very often. So I might be able to answer both questions. In terms of funding, I was going to pick up the funding and deprivation and what's the risk to us as a system. So yes, you're correct in assuming that the funding will now go directly to West Yorkshire and there will be a process of um, giving allocating those to place. Uh, we have been given um, reassurances that the formula that is currently used, and it's, I think it's called ACRA, I'm using the acronym because I don't know what it stands for, but it's some kind of methodology used centrally to uh, by somebody that um, takes account of some a level of deprivation, not, not a huge amount, because I think as core cities, we've always uh, been dissatisfied with that formula. But certainly that background calculation that would have told us what our CCG allocations would have been had we stayed as separate statutory bodies, that will still continue. So there will be a nominal figure available for the ICSs to use to decide how, in the first place, our fair shares would be at place level. Um, so that will continue in terms of funding. However, what it does also give us an opportunity to do is to um, Re reinvest those or pool those back at a West Yorkshire level without um, having these st statutory boundaries. If we feel there are things, mental health could be one example, where things that we'd like to do as a, uh, as a system rather than as, at place level, assuming that it suits all places to do it that way. Um, so that's that bit. And in terms of GP's front door, I don't know if other people know more than me, but certainly, um, and I don't know, Tony, if, if you're better than me to, to um, talk about that. But through the primary care networks, which is asking GPs to um, improve their capability of, uh, in terms of capacity and capability to engage with conversations at city level, 
Uh, we have nine primary care networks that have been um, set up from the 97 practices we have, and we are giving them a lot of support and the centre is giving them a lot of support to, to free up their leadership to be part uh, at the table and part of these conversations so that they feel that they have input and influence um, into the system as well. So that's what I was going to add. Thank you very much, Marcy. Okay. Yes, I can come in on the back of that. And I think uh, Thea might still be online and might be able to come in on some of the GP things um, as well. Um, but one of the things that we've had at the heart of the Leeds approach has been to try and bring um, GPs and elected members in particular um, together via local care partnerships. Primary care networks also are, are part of that conversation. And what that's all about is obviously bringing people together at local level to, to plan local services. And that also involves uh, obviously social care, uh, third sector and, and community organisations as well. And, and, you know, during the pandemic, that those systems on the whole have, have, have worked really, really well. And just on the, on the deprivation point as well, it's absolutely a key issue. There's no question, you know, we are in a, a really challenging environment. Um, you know, and everyone that's mentioned health inequalities is absolutely right to, to do so. You know, if you look at the latest index of multiple deprivation, we know we have a great number of people um, living in the most deprived um, decile, the most deprived areas of Leeds. Uh, and we, might, we know we've got more children and young people living in those areas as well. So as well as integrating the health system um, and doing all this work, we also know that, you know, the things that create good health, you know, particularly around um, good jobs, decent housing, decent environment, air quality, green space are things that, that we've got to focus on as well. So I think a lot of the work that's, that's been alluded to here, uh, whether it's the West Yorkshire strategy, the Leeds Health and Wellbeing Board, the Health and Wellbeing strategy, and some of the, some of the other work. Um, it's about putting a lot of that stuff into practice now and focusing on delivery on the ground, you know, making sure we're getting more jobs for um, people in, in, in local areas, um, developing things like the Anchor Institutions Programme, which looks at sort of social value, looks at local procurement, uh, looks at the big institutions such as the health sector generating uh, small business and, and, and other things. Um, and as Julian, you know, did an excellent presentation to Health and Wellbeing Board a couple of weeks ago, telling us about the opportunity to employ local people um, in the new hospital developments and, and to do some really proactive, progressive work there. Um, and that health inequalities work is going to be a main feature of, of everything that we do um, from September onwards. Um, but yeah, it's, it, it's absolutely fair to say it's, it's a challenging environment in, in, in some areas and some indicators, as you'll all be all too aware, around life expectancy and healthy life expectancy and not exactly going in the right direction, albeit there is ongoing progress in some areas as well. Thank you very much, Tony. And that's good to know that's high in the priorities um, for yourself and all of us too. So thank you. Councillor Delson, have you got a follow up question? You're muted. You're muted. Sorry, it's, what, it's just on what Tony said to, to end because, you know, it, it, everything is said is, is right. You know, it, where you live, uh, the amount of greenery you've got around you, everything still leads to where we are. How do you square that circle with other departments around better housing, the private rented sector, around education, around jobs? Where's their place at the table to actually make health outcomes better? It isn't all around the NHS. It's based on lots of other things as well. And it would be really interesting to look at one or two of these 10 pillars that you've got and see and have that route map from where we are with the statistics, who's dealing with it now, to where we want to be and where that will actually lead us to get to there. Thank you, Councillor Dawson. Um, Victoria. You're muted. Sorry. Sorry, I, I muted myself rather than unmuted. Um, just briefly to um, endorse Councillor Dawson's comments. Um, the last thing we want this to be is a focus on structure and reorganisation and, and acronyms. Um, you know, we're certainly, and, I, and I'm certainly with colleagues working really hard to make sure that this is 
about the focus on health outcomes rather than organisational structure. Um, it's really, really helpful to have this conversation today with, with yourselves um, that, that quite rightly are, are raising that point around how we hold ourselves to account on, on that real focus on those health outcomes. Um, and I, I think that this feels like it should be central to our future com conversations um, to say, uh, you know, how, how, how have the new arrangements made a difference and how are they continuing to make a difference? Um, but I, I, I certainly um, welcome your comments, Councillor Dawson. At Dowson and um, it is something that we want to be absolutely at the centre of the local um, approach. Thanks Chair. Um, yeah so just, just just a really important point about other, other council directorates that was made as well I mean we have made a huge amount of progress on this one um, over the last couple of years or so, um, in particular, there's been a, a, a large amount of work with city development, um, looking at employment and skills, um, and looking at employment for particularly for, for people with, with mental health um, and learning disabilities. Um, and there's around 50 organisations signed up to the uh, employment and health programme uh, around employability. Um, there's the Anchor Institutions Programme, which, as I've mentioned earlier, is all about using the power of the big city businesses to provide employment opportunities for people with um, particular needs. Um, and public health colleagues in particular have been working really closely with the communities team um, on the ground um, around understanding what works in communities. So it's, it's a really important point. Um, and, you know, and there's, there's also lots and lots of work with, with children's services as well around adverse childhood experience and um, all being part of a uh, child friendly as, uh, as well. And it is this approach that, that really has to emphasize uh, work on the, on the social determinants of health and our, our new health and wellbeing strategy will have a real focus on, on, on this stuff as well. Massive priority for us. Thank you very much, Tony. Councillor Taylor. Thanks, Chair. Um, I don't know if we really need a response. I just want to echo everything what my colleague, Councillor Darson said. And what I'm going back on is 2015-16, when we talk about um, the poorest should, should be held, would be more assist. We represent a very deprived area where there's a lot of illness and there's different areas. And I haven't seen where the poorest health come first, where anyone better. I'm still seeing obesity, you extra, you name it. The poor are still going through it. And this project is similar to when you say the poor is recovery quick and the poor is outcome first. So when we're going into a area, we need a third sector. How are we going to sell this to our communities when they says, you promised me in 15, 16 that my health would be assessed first and I'll be improved quicker. And if Tony remember every meeting, I used to say, how can you improve the um, poorest people quicker because deprived people are less um, fortunate with funding and whatever. And this is exactly similar, the same thing. You're going to bring it back into the community. And as it says, when you're taking something from individual, we have to give something back. Obesity, it's not everyone can pay to go to the gym. The doctor used to prescribe free activities. I think that is off the table. And there's so much things we need to put in place for the deprived area to help them to maintain their health. Mental health, after the pandemic, that's gonna be an absolutely crisis. Have we have funding specially for that young people and not just young people, adults as well. So I think activities are very good, but they just can't afford it. So I don't see how the poorest health are going to be improve quicker than the richest health. And that's something we need to look at. And I echo everything what my colleague said. And if you do look in the deprived area, we could make a decision proper from there. Thank you very much, Councillor Taylor. Um, I'll now call on um, Councillor Harrington, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's just to say really that being involved with one of the local care partnerships my concern is that that work will kind of get lost. And I know Tony alluded to it, that we are 
there, and uh, I think it was Bisse that said something about it as well, that there are many local care partnerships that are really just getting off the ground. And I'm hoping that that, is, that work isn't going to be lost because of all these new initiatives that are coming in and, and joining up all these other strategies and, 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 the, and the different groups of responsibilities that seem to be coming in with this new, new legislation. Because I think the local care partnership, certainly the one I'm involved with in the outer northeast, is looking at involving many, many more third sector organisations, which ties in with what uh, Councillor Taylor was just saying about those community groups. They're the ones that knows what's going on in their areas. Um, and we are trying to build on that in our local care partnership. So I'm really, that's my only worry that because there's so many other layers that are there, that we lose that impetus. And that, that's, that's one of the concerns that I have. And it will also mean that when we're looking at deprivation, and I know I say that it's at, this at every meeting and we'll continue to do so, it isn't only the inner city areas that have levels of deprivation. Outer northeast, uh, Otley, other outer areas also have small pockets. But again, I'm very concerned that they will be lost in all this other reorganisation stuff. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Harrington. Will any one of you like to com um, comment on that? Respond to that, sorry. Yes, Pierre. Yes, I lead the um, Local Care Partnerships Programme on behalf of the city. And um, I know Norm is very involved in, 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 the, in the work of one of the Local Care Partnerships and other people are. And absolutely, this um, is a, um, is a programme that is at the heart of our work of, as, as, as an integrated care partnership, an integrated way of working for Leeds. And I'd go back to what Kath was saying at the beginning in her presentation, which is that this is a continuation of a journey. This isn't a disruption of the journey. And the local care partnerships have been an example of how we have always in Leeds, or for some, some years now, wanted to bring people together and wanted to ensure that people could work more closely together at a local level. So we are very committed, Julian, Kath, myself, Sarah, that the, that the local care partnership should in time be leading and making more and more decisions. And they're the heart of our way of working. Um, and we won't go anywhere uh, fast if we, if we don't continue to support them. They, they, they will always take time to embed, but we're um, absolutely committed to them. And I absolutely promise you that. Thank you very much, Thea. Um, Councillor Arif. Thank you, Chair. I just want to follow up on what Councillor um, Taylor and Councillor Dalton have said. Um, you know, like, like them, I also represent um, an institute, an inner city one. I totally take on Councillor Harrington's point about deprivation just isn't assigned to the inner city areas. Um, but we also know that um, there was a certain population that suffered from COVID far more than other, other populations did. And I think going back to what Councillor Dawson has said about um, other departments having to play a role in, 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 in sort of the health inequality side of things. And to some extent, we've, we've done a little bit of that, Councillor Dawson, with the selective licensing that we've got in Hare Hills, because I know that some of our young children are living in really poor quality housing and therefore they're resulting in having asthma. But if we can tackle the housing aspect of it, then we can deal with the health aspect of it. And I think more of that work needs to happen. Um, obviously, I'm quite a new cabinet member, but I do have parks in my remit and I also have active lifestyles in my remit and the point I'm trying to make with the directors is we need to have the thread of public health running um, part of that because if you want to be healthy you need to be walking and then you need to be walking to your parks and the parks need to be accessible you know it all very much links and I'm and that's definitely somebody who comes from Hare Hills sees the inequalities that's a point that I'm politically going to try to, to lead on but I think everybody across the council has a role to play in terms of tackling the deprivation because public health runs through the thread runs through um, everything that we do really so I just wanted to make that point thank you chair thank you very much councillor Arif for that that's helpful um, can I call on Julian please if you've got any comments to make I do know you um, from your presentation last week, you can just shed more light for us, obviously. I do understand that lots of what's going on with this bill, we're still awaiting further confirmation and guidance and uncertainties at the moment, but just something to assure us of where we are. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Chair. And, and thank you very much for the opportunity to um, come along to this session. Um, just first of all, to 
uh, restate the point Theo was making about the support we all have for the partnerships locally and how all as, as we as, as local leaders we do the very best as part of this um, successive as I think Dr Bill was describing reorganisation to get the best out of it we can for our um, communities, citizens and people. So from our perspective we're, we're working hard in Leeds teaching hospitals to um, be a genuine anchor institution which means that we have an interest not just in what happens in the hospital but across all of the communities we serve. Uh, we're working particularly closely with the Health and Care Academy and working hard on creating greater employment opportunities for um, people that live in immediate areas, priority neighbourhoods of the city, for example, example, Lincoln Green, which is adjacent to St James, and indeed in many of the areas that councillors on this board represent. Um, I think for us, a big part of this is obviously the opportunity uh, that I've spoken about before at the Health and Wellbeing Board about the planned investment in hospitals, which shouldn't be seen just as an investment in hospital estate, but is essentially about transforming the care and treatment of our children in relation to the children's hospital uh, at the Leeds General Infirmary, and also the redevelopment of our part of our adult services that will give us greater facilities and access to things like critical care and uh, the latest advances in surgical techniques, which in turn, all of that will support um, the left shift that Kath spoke about, because the more we're able to do from a specialist perspective in hospital, where we can treat people uh, who need to be in hospital quickly and effectively with really good outcomes, uh, then the more that can be done in community services and patients that don't need to come into hospital can be dealt with more effectively and ultimately the plans for the new hospital estate see a, it in overall terms a smaller hospital rather than a bigger one which should mean we can leverage uh, investment in community and primary services to complement the pathways that patients will go on as they move between the different parts of the system our goal as leaders is to make sure that's as integrated as possible so that if you're a patient, you're not having to continue, continually sort of repeat the same account just because you're in a different part of the NHS or social care, that things are joined up with good information systems and that, the, that we, we try to empower our patients and public with the information they need to make the right decisions and to support the way in which we as organisations work together. We've got some big challenges at the moment, not least because we've got over 100 patients with COVID in the hospital. You might think from some of the media reports, obviously with six days of reduction in infections, uh, that things are okay. Well, I have to say from a hospital's perspective, and I'm sure Victoria would support this, we still need to be cautious and vigilant around that. And we, we are still seeing hospitalizations as a consequence of COVID. So we're we're reinforcing the importance of vaccination, but also of the necessary um, uh, wise and, and cautious um, measures that, that we've all been taking to uh, try to make sure that we're, we're, we're not seeing those hospitalizations rise and uh, patients uh, suffering harm as a consequence. So we've got a lot to do, but I, what I would also say, Chair, is that we have seen um, a big increase in patients seeking urgent care. And that goes across the whole health and care system in primary care, in community services, in mental health, and in particularly in, in hospitals where our emergency departments are experiencing the highest attendances we've seen. Uh, so clearly we've got to work hard to try to make sure that this integration we've been talking about deals with some of those pressures and challenges as well. So in overall terms, I think we, we'd we support the, the idea behind the integration of care. I think there is a lot of focus on the governance and the, as, as a number of colleagues have pointed out already, the kind of um, the, the acronyms and the complexity, which I think we need to sort of kind of push to one side and focus what, on what matters for our communities and our patients in all of this. And for me, that is about how we join things up uh, 
even more so than, than we, we do now. And we give our staff the opportunity to work in a range of different settings. And we ultimately deliver the care uh, and quality of treatment and service to our, our residents that, that they, will, they will need. So uh, I'm happy to answer any questions on those comments, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gillian. Um, I'll just add to, I believe, what um, Councillor Dowson was saying in terms of the acronym. Definitely, we know the focus and what we would like to do in terms of the community and people. But obviously, it's just for our benefit and for the public as well who are, who are listening to us when we're making presentations and when we're speaking, that we just reduce the use of acronyms and just make it as simple as possible so that everyone um, can understand. So thank you very much for that. Councillor Dowson. Yeah, I, I found that pr presentation, Julian, quite interesting in so much as it sounded to me like you were talking about utilising smaller hospitals, which is which is really interesting if that is the case, because we used to have a lot of smaller hospitals in Leeds. And it's a bit like setting up the CCGs and then they're going to go and changing systems. We have the Wharfdale Hospital, which, to be quite honest, is probably underutilised. We, we had Seacroft. I mean, there's, there's tons of them all over Leeds that have, have come and gone. And hopefully, from what you've said, they're going to come back again. Um, but uh, somebody pointed out the cost of actually doing all this chopping and changing is, is quite extensive, I would, have uh, I would have thought. But the other one is, is around utilising third sector organisations. You've just told us about the strain that the NHS is under and, and as somebody has used that serious healthcare system over lockdown, I can tell you it works brilliantly, but I could see on the faces of the staff the stress that they're actually under through overwork. Um, which And somebody mentioned using third sector organisations with a lot of the prevention we're talking about. And I do believe we need to have an emphasis on prevention so we're not putting such, so, such, such great strain on the health, the hospital services. You've, you've got people like Leeds Rhinos Foundation and Leeds United who are doing things about mental, around mental health and sport. You've got uh, men's weight sessions. You've got all sorts of third sector organisations that are very rarely referred into by GPs, very rarely referred into, and I have personal experience of that. So I can quote you if you want to contact me later about how this lack of referral of people into a system that they would accept and they would work within. If you're a sporty person or have been, or you love sport, being referred for weight uh, maintenance to somebody who actually is has a focus on something you're interested in and that you will go to and you will stick at because it's something you love it's much better than saying oh go and look at it on a computer um so i think we need to get that pathway right prevention is key and i just think we need to think a little greater about the support we give our gps to actually deliver that preventative service through the third sector organizations Thank you very much, Councillor Dell. I believe we also have GPs on our one of our work schedules. Angela, is that correct? I think October or November. Um, yes, Chair, it's for October in terms October. of um, same day service responses. That's that that will caption it in that as well. Thank you. So prepare for them, Councillor Dalson. Yeah. Fabulous. Excellent. Any more questions, comments? For our guests. Okay, what I would like, yes, um, Victoria. Oh, sorry, before I come to Victoria, Councillor Nash, she hasn't spoken at all, so I'd love to hear from you. You're muted. Yeah, uh, right. Well, um, I'm a relative uh, beginner here. I, I, I did serve on the original health committee. I, I won't tell you how many years ago, but um, the the health service has reorganised so much. I I am an absolute beginner. I've been listening very carefully uh, to what has been said, but it does strike me that there's no money forthcoming for this, and I I think that local authorities will probably have to bear the brunt uh, ag again and be blamed for any failure of delivery. Not because they don't want to, but because they haven't got the funds to do so. Uh, the uh, governments have been marvelous in the past 
uh, passing on the responsibilities to local government without giving it the, the backup or finance. Um, I take the Yorkshire Post on uh, Saturdays and on the front page, uh, there was um, a, a piece which said, charities to press ministers to honour pledge over social care. And uh, it's quite a, a long article, uh, but what it says is that uh, the, the pandemic has exposed our mess of a social care system like never before. At least 34,000 people with dementia, by far the largest users of social care, have died, and many more have dramatically deteriorated. This wasn't an inevitable situation, but a structural failing. Uh, and uh, they're talking about uh, uh, more money so that the charities can do the job. Uh, and I, I may have missed it, but I don't think this afternoon any mention was made of the work that various charities do, um, which, which support the NHS and indeed relieve uh, some of the pressure from the NHS. Um, perhaps somebody would like to uh, comment on that. Thank you, Councillor Nash. I'll bring in Victoria and then anyone who would like to um, respond to Councillor Nash, that would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, it, it was really just a short point to um, to pick up on a couple of things Julian said, and also um, Councillor Dowson's um, response with the with the example of the Leeds Rhinos uh, third sector work. Um, I think it, in, in terms of um, the brief the brief situation Julian's described around uh, really understanding the pressures even now um, on the hospital around COVID, you know, all of the learning as a system that we've had over the last 17 months is that we know that there is a there is a direct relationship between how we work with communities and um, and keep people well, or in the example of COVID, keep rates down, and then and then the the, the direct pressure that hits the health system if if that's if that doesn't work well upstream in prevention. And I think that all of our learning through COVID and before COVID um, it, it can equally be applied to every single health issue that, that we know hits the system, whether it's um, alcohol, smoking, obesity, um, all of those br um, wider impacts on health. So I think that the, the point is so well made and, and connected to Councillor Dowson's response there around, you know, real commitment to investment in, in prevention and, and particular work to keep people well. Um, and, and actually, we know the consequences if, if we don't do that. I think the reality, which, which actually does correspond to some of Councillor Nash's comments just now, is that 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 mostly the, the, the commissioning of those prevention third sector activities, you know, come as part of the local authorities' public health, you know, commissioning programme. Um, and, and we need to still continue to make the case why, why it's important to continue our commitment to, 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 to invest in, in those, because not only are they good in themselves, but they, they do have a direct impact on the, on the pressures of the NHS. So I think that um, in terms of the, the new system, the evolution of this new system, um, challenging ourselves to, to understand that independence even more, um, I, think, I think that it, it really summarises that well. So I just wanted to, um, to reflect those comments back and say that's absolutely what we, what we really want to do. And, and um, we would welcome scrutiny boards um, support in, in ask, you know, asking difficult questions around how that's going, because ultimately that will be our, our challenge. So thank you. So, sorry, I couldn't hear you, Abigail. I did have my hand up. Were you asking me to speak? Yes, your hands are yeah, up. Sorry, sorry. Your voice was very faint for some reason. I just wanted to respond to the really specific point that Councillor Nash made about charities. I did refer in my opening comments to the charity I used to work in, Leeds Survive Allied Crisis Service, that has an NHS contract. So it's really specifically funded by the NHS. 
um, to keep people out of NHS services. So they deliver out of hours mental health crisis services to keep people out of psychiatric beds, a &E, police contact, other statutory services. Um, and there are other charities in Leeds that have NHS contracts, so Touchstone, Community Links, Mind, for example, and they do a huge range of activity that supports both the council and the NHS's work, um, you know, in, in delivering better health outcomes. So you've got charities delivering what's called social prescribing, where they work alongside GPs and support GPs to prescribe social well-being type activities alongside um, you know, medication or clinical um, interventions. IAPT um, is, uh, is a specific partnership between the NHS and, counsel and counselling services to deliver counselling across the city. There's other counselling provision as well that's commissioned, you know, by the NHS or, or by, the, by the council. Um, as I was saying in my opening comments, that the, the, the delivery of services by charities is... Um, one aspect that will be better for not having to go through competitive tendering because that's incredibly burdensome for, you know, particularly smaller community based, you know, often really grassroots organisations that are very accessible to people who are using their services, but are, could be are very threatened by um, th those kind of those processes sometimes. Um, also, you, you, with reference to, I mean, I haven't read the article, I'm only going from the headlines, but um, a lot of charities have been campaigning and lobbying government to better fund social care. So within the children's world, for example, the big charities like Corum, NSPCC, Bernardo's have done a lot of um, national lobbying about um, how desperately children's social care needs to be better funded. So they're quite... Um, Charities quite often have a campaigning element as well as a service delivery element, and they've certainly been using their platforms during the pandemic to highlight the crisis in social care funding. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Benner. Um, Kath? I just wanted to highlight that with the NHS plan did come um, an increase in investment in NHS care, and that. Uh, we can see that uh, in new roles in primary care. So primary care teams have been able to expand with uh, new roles like uh, being able to invest in uh, physiotherapy or expert medicines management, uh, sometimes OT. Um, and also there is um, investment in community health services through something called the Ageing Well Programme. Uh, which I think at the moment it's about three million pounds and we were only discussing this week what would be a wise way to spend that money and in particular looking at as people's health needs have changed we are spotting far more people living with chronic ill health in the community so some of those people need really intensive enhanced support so already there is investment in something that's called a virtual ward. But if we were to sort of unpack that as a, a, bit of a, a sort of a professional's term, I would just describe it as enhanced care in the community. Um, so to give peripatetic support to those really, really vulnerable people who would otherwise turn up at St. James's and possibly be a hospital admission. So there, there is new investment in the NHS. Unfortunately, it's not much by investment in social care. Thank you very much, Kath. Okay, have we got any more comments or questions? We're coming to the end of this agenda now. Um, I would like to also say that um, very detailed presentation by Kath is also available. So if anyone would like to have a copy of the presentation. Um, Angela is more than happy to share that with us. So thank you very much again, Kath, for that um, presentation. I would like to ask yourself and um, Councillor Venner if you can just should suggest, you know, roughly a time frame on when you can update us further. I know there are lots of things that are uncertain regarding the bill, but obviously um, we would like at some point to know, to have updates on where we are with the bill. Um, I should imagine possibly by the next scrutiny board, we'd have an idea of how we want to constitute our local board. 
uh, and what that architecture might look like with some of the subcommittees. So as a minimum, we'll be able to come back with that. Um, if they do publish the additional guidance as promised by, again, the end of um, this month, then if, if there's content there, we, we'll come back with some updates on that as well. So I can't remember when the next scrutiny board is actually. Um, maybe I September. Um, September. All right. I, I'm confident we'll have some more stuff to report back to um, scrutiny board by then. Excellent. Thank you very much. So huge thank you to yourself and to your team, to um, Julian, all of you for attending. As always, we truly appreciate it. Um, I would also like to add, as we're also a scrutiny board for um, Active Lifestyle, I do not know how many of you have been watching the Olympics. Normally my eyes are kind of brighter than they are today, but I stay up till about two, three in the morning watching Olympics. So uh, it's been great to see what the Yorkshire lads are doing. I have also just been told that we've gotten the very first ever bronze med medal in women's gymnastics since 1928. Our women not doing us proud. Yesterday, we had little Miss Taylor for the triathlon. Oh, my goodness. Did you see how on that bike? He was something else. So, yes, Councillor Arif did speak about active lifestyle and keeping healthy. That is our wealth. So wherever you find two minutes in the day, encourage somebody to keep fit. Make sure they watch the Olympics. I know with the time difference, it's crazy timing. But honestly, once you start to watch it, it's just amazing. And Leeds is doing so well. I mean, look at the Leeds lads have put us on the map. Even those countries I've never heard of Leeds now. So try and share the good news with, with whoever you can share. We, were, uh, we did speak earlier and Councillor Hatbrook did say that if it was, um, if Yorkshire was a country, we would have been number, you know, we should, actually we should have been number eight according to the statistics. So let's keep keeping on and please let's cheer Team GB in what um, they're doing. So I think we have about three or four gold medals now. Little Miss Taylor yesterday had a, silver in the triathlon we had little legs from manchester bless her so that was really really good so yes thank you for that and let's keep keeping active i will now call on angela just to um quick chat about our work schedule before we finish thank you chair i don't know how i'm going to follow that but there we go we'll move on to the work schedule um so this report uh, relates to the board's forthcoming work schedule so last month the members discussed possible areas of work for the board to undertake this year. So the latest version that's set out in Appendix 1 has been drafted to reflect the board's discussion. So members are asked to consider and discuss whether they would like to make any suggested changes at this stage. Um, as it currently stands, within the schedule itself, there are two work items for September, but obviously I'll add a third item regarding uh, and a further update with, um, on the development of the ICS um, given what's just been agreed. Um, so one of the items for September relates to improving same day response services. And as I mentioned um, very briefly at the last item, this will encapsulate GP services as well. The other item references uh, the re-engagement of specialist commission services, but just to provide further clarity in terms of what we actually mean by this, I'm proposing to, to reword it to talk about the restart and prioritisation plans for the delivery of NHS health check programme, as this was the main area of interest um, to members last month. Um, and there was all, also earlier discussion from members about the potential status of this board meeting in September. So again, as it currently stands, it is proposed that this meeting be held as a, as a remote consultative meeting. So I'll pass back to you now, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, so it's the 7th of September and I believe it's the same time Angela one o'clock one thirty it's at one thirty start with a one o'clock pre nature okay so from all of us at the scrutiny board for health adults and active lifestyle thank you so much for coming as always truly truly appreciated and good luck with all the work you're doing and thank you don't forget to watch the Olympics it's athletics next <laughs> week that's my specialty so I'm looking forward to that one Take care and have